Welcome. My name is Robert Boynton. I'm a professor here at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at New York University. And I'm very happy to welcome here uh, a number of collectives, a collective of collectives, a co-op of co-ops. Uh, and uh, this is an incredibly exciting time uh, for journalism, incredibly chaotic time for journalism. But uh, I was delighted that we were able to host this not only because I admire DECA and I admire the, the uh, people who have, who have organized it and the kind of work they're doing and the goals and aims they have, but I'm a champion of anyone who is uh, dedicated to experimentation in journalism, who starts off thinking about how can I create great journalism in whatever form, whether audio, video, still photography, written word, um, not so much someone who's trying to start a journalism business. Uh, that I'm less interested in and, and frankly less hopeful for. But uh, I am a, uh, uh, a, a great partisan of uh, content and believe that people will always be interested in really good long form work. And uh, I really admire people who are trying to experiment with that and actually instead of just yapping about it at conferences, actually putting uh, together money and uh, effort and trying to uh, create something better. Uh, so I'm very happy to have those people here. Uh, I'd also like to put in one plug to anyone who's listening uh, to donate to the Radiotopia Kickstarter campaign. They're at 16000 at 20000 I think they get an extra $20,000 matching grant. You can give as little as $1. I'd give again, but I've already given. I can't be counted that way. Uh, so anyone who's listening sh should uh, think about doing that. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce Vanessa Gazari of DECA, the, the co-founder, and, um, and then we'll start the discussion. Vanessa. Rob, thank you so, so much for this um, and, and for having all of us. Uh, before we get to our panelists, I'm just going to say a few words. Uh, thank you all for coming here tonight. This is really great to see so many people here for this conversation. And I'm um, really curious. I'm not sure that there's been uh, a conversation with, with these, uh, these players uh, involved. And I'm really curious to see what gets said here tonight. Um, so uh, Rob generously offered to throw us this launch party, and we thought this would be um, a really helpful opportunity for DECA to talk with some people who have actually done the collective thing successfully, um, because we're still very much learning uh, how to do this, and we need all the help we can get. Um, and uh, I, before I get further, I want to announce we have two uh, great new members of DECA, um, uh, Rania Abouzid and Beth Dickinson. And I'm just going to read a little bit about them, um, not to overwhelm you with bio information. But Rania uh, is an award-winning journalist covering the Middle East with a focus on Syria. Her writing has appeared in Time, The New Yorker, Foreign Affairs, National Geographic, Politico, and many other outlets. She's also a television commentator on Mideast affairs and has given talks at Harvard, Princeton, the New America Foundation, and lots of other places. She's uh, Lebanese-Australian and lives in Beirut. And Beth Dickinson is a Gulf-based American journalist whose work has appeared in The New Yorker, Foreign Policy, The Economist, Christian Science Monitor, and The National. She's author of the Kindle single, Who Shot Ahmed, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's about the murder at the height of Bahrain's Arab Spring, a murder at the height of Bahrain's Arab Spring. Um, and she was the first Western journalist to chronicle the private Kuwaiti donor network funding Syria's opposition. She's written extensively about uh, Gulf financing of that conflict. Um, so we're really excited to welcome both of them. And uh, I'm sort of putting the cart before the horse by telling you that because you're going to sort of learn more about what DECA is and who we are if you don't already know. And then that will make more sense to you, um, un unless you're a member in it or a Kickstarter donor and have been getting our updates and know um, all about what's going on. Um, the, the next thing um, I just wanted to say was that I, I can now tell you what our next four stories are going to be. Uh, about, and I don't know if you're waiting with bated breath for this announcement, but I'm just going to go for it. Um, the the fur, or in no particular order, because we're not sure exactly about the order yet. But from Mac Funk, who's here um, in the in the very professorial uh, sweater with the 
um, the, the, the elbow patches. Um, so Shell Oil has just announced plans to return to the Arctic, and we're about to release a story by Mac um, about the shipwreck that foiled their plans the last time around. Uh, with us also is DECA co-founder Mark Herman. Um, Hi, Mark, um, who's uh, about to uh, fly back to Barcelona, where he lives, tomorrow, uh, to finish a story on the potential secession of Catalonia from Spain, um, which could begin as, as early as 72 hours from now. So stay tuned for that. Um, from Sonia Falero, who is uh, our, one of our uh, Europe-based members, uh, based sort of in both in London and in India, um, we have a story coming on village justice in a remote part of India. And from Tom Zollner in uh, Los Angeles, a tale of silver mining and voyeurism in Bolivia. So um, those are those are what we what we hope to. Um, present to you, we will present to you in the next few months, and, and Mac will have more of a timeline, I think, on that, perhaps. Um, uh, one other sort of housekeeping thing, somewhere there should be sign-up sheets. Is, is Zana here? She's late on her train. Okay, all right, so at some point, there will be sign-up sheets um, around, maybe even on clipboards, which we thought would be really like hyper-professional, where if you could put your name and your email address, we will get you, uh, make sure to get you our first three stories. So those are the two that have already come out, uh, one based in Shanghai and uh, one about, um, really about immigration. Uh, a lot of it takes place in Africa. Um, and very, very different stories. And then whatever story comes next. Um, so that's what, that'll be your prize for showing up tonight, but only if we get your name and email address. Um, so, uh, you know, Others are gonna talk in more detail, and I, I may even talk a little bit when, we, when Rob comes back up here um, about you know, what, what we are and why we, how, how we came to be what we are. Um, but just real quick, I mean, we, we had um, uh, our, first, our first book uh, by Mara Vistendahl, um, which is a true crime uh, story that takes place in Shanghai. Um, was a bestseller in the Kindle single nonfiction store uh, for two weeks, and we still really have a lot of questions about how to do this. And so, as I said at the beginning, I'm really looking forward to hearing what folks say tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a, a little bit like, uh, maybe a little bit off topic, but because I'm gonna disappear at some point, perhaps rather soon from this stage, um, DECA has produced significantly more children than stories since June, um, and I'm just gonna shamelessly blame <laughs> my six-week-old baby for the fact that I'm gonna have to leave um, probably a little bit before this ends. Um, we actually have produced two stories and four children um, in that time. <laughs> So there is a business model, <laughs> um, and we're not worried about the finances at all. So uh, with that, I can sort of turn it over back to Rob or to Mac. Um, I don't know if you want to. I think just have everybody introduce. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. More importantly, everybody introduce yourselves. I guess we each have mics. Hello, uh, my name is Jonathan <laughs> Seal. I'm representing uh, an organization that I started with several other people called Mason Jar Music, and uh, it's a creative collective where we have a studio in Brooklyn, we make um, records, we make videos, and uh, have branched out in some other things now, some tours and shows and gallery ex exhibits and all sorts of things. So um, yeah, I'm probably the youngest person here and uh, maybe the young one of the younger people in the room, but uh, hopefully I'll have something to say. <laughs> I'm Mackenzie Funk. I actually just look old, but I'm really young, <laughs> so whatever. And uh, I live in Seattle. I'm one of the founding members of DECA. Uh, I'm Tyler Cabot. I'm a uh, features editor at Esquire uh, and also have been working on, on a lot of our efforts to kind of mess around with uh, paywalls and new monetization strategies and, and other new things and stuff. My name is Benjamin Walker and uh, I, I'm a radio person podcaster and which for the first time in 10 years, I'm not embarrassed to say the word podcaster is great because things are going so well and I'm a founding member of Radiotopia, which is a podcast network. Uh, my name is Ron Haviv. I'm the co-founder of a seven photo agency. I'd like to uh, congratulate DECA for all your production as well as the uh, couple of written articles that you guys have done as well. Um, I, uh, we founded uh, seven uh, 13 years ago and I can remember our um, 
opening night similar to this, and so I congratulate you guys for, for beginning a very exciting adventure. And, and I should say for those who are, might notice DECA and their 10 of us, seven, seven photographers, we have, we're very much inspired specifically by these guys, so we're glad they're here. I guess the first thing I'd like to ask, the first thing I'd like to say is uh, how much it's similar to and how much it's different from uh, other collectives and where you drew your inspiration and you know, a, a, a brief uh, description of the story of how, you know, what drove you to get together and, um, and create this uh, co-op. I, they'll probably know better how they work than, than I do, but I'd say one, one big difference from what, at least our understanding, of, the original example was Magnum, I think for, for Seven as well, uh, of a, a photo agency that photography is different in that if you're ethical, you're not going to necessarily edit photos to make them good. So, and the, and the short answer as to how is the writing collective different than, than say, a classical version of a photo agency is that we can edit one another and in fact we have to. And that means a lot more uh, structure or at least a need for it. In our case, uh, we did notice early on after we designed our logo that it looks really a lot like an anarchy symbol. <coughs> like I, I was literally at the playground with one of these many children we produced and I looked out and I said like, hey, it's our logo. But you know, so. So I think that is one difference is the level, and, and this might be true, I don't know with, with Radiotopia, but I, I think the level of coordination is maybe higher than some. The founding of it was that Mark Herman in the back there wrote an excellent Kindle single on Libya. And that was 2012? Yeah. 2012, and, and some incredible on the ground reporting in Libya, and it was, this is when Kindle singles were new. And the idea was, if you publish a loan, it's very possible you'll, your story will just die on the vine. If you gather together, there's just been this technological shift. If you gather together, publish together under a single brand, make it a mark of quality, and, and crucially edit each other and promote each other and share some of the profits so that the one that happens to be a bestseller, not based on quality, but based on, on luck and all that, can help support this important work that needs doing. Uh, we didn't want to get stuck writing things that were like, this will sell, this will be commercial. Only we wanted to do effectively stories that weren't being told, because foreign reporting budgets have gone down, and and to find a, a place for that. And that was the idea was that early on we would do mostly Kindle singles, and we would do all digital because it was allegedly seamless. And how did you guys all to get together? I mean, what was the process of this sort of hey guys, let's put on a show? Mark Mark could probably speak a little bit better to this, but you and Stefan Ferris, who's who's based in Rome. You guys talked first. Stefan approached you, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I got yeah. a bunch of calls from correspondence. Yeah, basically, how do you do this? Kindle sync, this digital thing is new. What do I do? And, and from that, they, Mark said, well, I did great, but if we had a bunch of us together, we could do better. And then they started reaching out to people. Uh, at first, it was personal connections, and it was people we admired. Two rules, uh, no assholes, and do we like their writing? I mean, that's basically it. And sometimes that's a personal connection. And some others, Sonia Falero, none of us had a personal connection with her yet. Um, you know, and, and Google Hangouts. That's how we do these big group meetings across the continents. And how does that compare to other, I mean, you took your inspiration from Magnum. Magnum is certainly the, one of the most famous of these kinds of co-ops. I mean, I guess my first question is, one, is that true? Is Magnum, is that the sort of the gold standard for these sorts of co-ops? And, and two, how does this compare to w the way you did it to let's say Radiotopia did it, or Ron Habib, or, or you've done it with music? I think uh, Magnum is definitely an inspiration for a few of us in Radiotopia that you know, are, that know what it is. But I think in, for it's really sort of, uh, in the radio world, this is a brand new opening. I mean, it, I mean it, before podcasting, oh. you know, you wanted to work in radio, you had to work in radio. <laughs> you had to be at the, the radio station. So what's so exciting about this moment is you're seeing a lot of people having success with podcasts, but yet it's sort of what Mac was talking about. There's something about building a new institution, bringing people together, sort of maybe for a mark of quality. You know, everyone has a podcast now, which is kind of a joke, but it's true, everyone does have a podcast. So there, I think there's part of that too, is sort of like, I think it's the mark of quality and also figuring out um, what we could take from the radio station model, you know, the infrastructure uh, to sort of support it. And then the question is, well, yeah, 
how, you know, I think that the children thing, that you've had all these children, it makes sense to me because I think in this world where we're all sort of on our own, there's no stability, there's no financial stability at all. Like maybe you'll get a freelance assignment. And I think that, you know, thinking of families and just sort of some kind of stability, I think doing it on our own as creators makes a lot more sense. And Ron, how, about, how about you with your collective, with your co-op photography? How did that come about? Well, we came about when um, probably in the early 2000s, late 1990s, Mark Getty and Bill Gates um, decided to start to uh, try to control as much imagery as possible because they thought that uh, if you own the imagery that's on the internet, that would be the most successful uh, way to succeed. And so they started to buy up uh, all of these small photo agencies that existed that were supplying photographs to newspapers and magazines around the world. And four of the photographers, four of the founding members of Seven were represented by one of these small agencies that was bought up uh, by Bill Gates's company, Corbis. And we, um, we realized that we had lost control of our um, decision making, our ability to decide both in terms of f photography and business decisions uh, were no longer in our hands. We didn't want to be part of a multinational. And that was the impetus to basically go out in this um, in this atmosphere of huge corporations and, and start off on our own. And so when we launched, uh, we launched in a photo festival in, in France and many of uh, our colleagues and, and the people that work with us gave us three, four months to survive and thought we would, we would be gone. Um, we, the date that we launched was September 9th, 2001. So the world changed two days later and we were some of the foremost documentarians of, of that period of time, and we've been working for the last 13 years. And, and would you say that in your case that your co-op is essentially running along the same business principles as Magnum or these other co-ops that before they were co-opted by Microsoft? Um, I, I think you know, Magnum, of course, was, was the example. We tried and are still trying to sort of be a smaller, smaller version of them and try not to make some of the mistakes that um, that they made in the past, and we're making our own mistakes. And Magnum is now trying to avoid the mistakes that we're making, and and so on. Um, but I think you know, one of the key things that's really changed in the last few years, in terms of survival of photographers in these photo agencies, is that we're shifting from content suppliers to actually being content destinations. And this is a huge, huge shift. And the more that we, as photographers, can control our uh, interaction with our audience, the more successful we can be. What, 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 the, what does that mean, content je je destinations? Do you mean actually becoming publications of some sort? Of some sort. With ours, for seven social media, we're reaching several million people. And so we have some individual photographers and the group as a whole have more um, audience members than monthly magazines ha have uh, subscribers. So this is really changing the dynamics of, of how we're working um, and how we're surviving as photographers in this, in this new atmosphere. One of the things that seems to be common to most of these startups, whether they're in whatever medium they're in, is Kickstarter or some other kind of crowdsourcing, crowdfunding program. And, uh, you know, as I, I, I felt funny, you know, uh, today I realized I was, you know, like half of these different uh, uh, startups I've donated to myself which is not usual, but uh, you know, that some schmo like me is donating 50 or 100 bucks to so many of these things means I think that, th that there is this, not just this willingness to pay, but that there's this idea that it's almost like a public good you know, to keep these sort of cultural institutions going. Uh, Ron Habib was discussing how their business model was more or less the same as another photo a agency, but a smaller one with a, a social media dimension. What's the role of, of these kind of crowdsourced Kickstarter sourced kinds of uh, startups. Is that a, uh, simply a way to launch? Is that an operating sort of reality that will continue? Well, I think for Radiotopia, at, you know, Kickstarter's always been, I think we've, for radio people, we just kind of laugh. It's, a, it's the public radio business model. I mean, you know, listener supported content. <laughs> Whereas I think a lot of other mediums have had a harder time plugging in to the Kickstarter and making it work. 
for us, it was like, haha, you know, it's just like the same exact thing. But what's exciting for the listeners and our backers is they are giving it directly to the shows they like. I remember when I worked at WNYC, there was a moment where I was in a meeting uh, and someone that worked in the development department said, you know, too many listeners write us saying they want to give money to Radiolab. We need to teach them that they need to give money to WNYC. And I thought that was like such an amazing moment because I, I think the, l the relationship you have as a creator with your audience, uh, the, the listener support can really push that, you can really build on that connection. So I think for us, it's, it makes perfect sense. And that's why I think we, we're doing so well. And is this, I mean, is the Kickstarter both for DECA and for, for the Radiotopia? I mean, DECA is going to have subscriptions, and so that will be, or will there be, or in addition, will there be sort of a perpetual series of Kickstarter campaigns the way we have these perpetual series of, 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 of fundraising campaigns at WNYC? Well, maybe more like a, a year, like once a year thing. I don't know if we'd need to do four a day like some of the stations do. But uh, I do think sort of getting your audience to say, well, here's another season we're going to support. But, you know, so Roman Mars, who, you know, is pretty much the, the ringleader, main founder for Radiotopia with 99% Invisible, he doesn't want to do another Kickstarter. And now we, we've just added three shows, so we're 10. So the idea next year of doing something like this probably isn't feasible. Um, so I think we're going to look at other platforms that are emerging. I mean, Kickstarter does have that kickstart in the title. You know, it's sort of getting something started. And I think sustaining, you, you know, again, I think the radio model is probably a leg up over some of the other, like, people are used to having us ask again, but if I start your magazine and you come back to me, or I help you start your magazine and you come back to me, it's like, come on. So I, th I think we have it easier, maybe. Can you just remind us how much money you've raised so far on Kickstarter? Uh, I think it's like 470,000 right wow, now, and okay. we still have nine days left. Crowdfunding. But you know, that number is, is, is interesting. What's more interesting is that we have almost uh, is like 14, 16,000 backers. That's like amazing. That's way more. I mean, the money is, is exciting, but the fact that 16,000 people have signed up for something that they, you know, takes a few steps, that's awesome. I think that's really interesting what you said about radio, it being a natural thing for radio to ask for money this way because. I just wanted to, I feel like it's unsustainable for us. Like, I almost feel like the Kickstarter money we raised is like not real money in some way. That now we have to, like we have some money, but it's like the money you're not supposed to touch because now you actually have to go out and make your money. You know, like that money that you have in like a savings account where you're like, I'm not gonna, that's just there to let me know that I have some money or something, you know what? Um, you know, if, <laughs> like $500. But, um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I can't see us going back to people again and saying, Hey, could you give us more? Because also because we have a subscription model. I I could see us getting some money though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what is the, what is? The, I mean, it's funny when people uh, you know when the uh, the journalism crisis was sort of in its first phase, and I remember about a year or two into it, people were embracing what they called the public radio model, A.K.A. getting money for content from the people who listen. You know, and. You know, it, it, what's amazing, if you told me 10 years ago the New York Times would derive half of its income from, from actual people paying to read the paper as opposed to 90% of it from advertising, I would have said you're out of your mind. So, I mean, you know, there are certain publications where this kind of shift has been made very successfully. But could, so, so DECA is going gonna, is gonna to rely more or entirely after the Kickstarter money is uh, spent uh, on subscriptions. Um, you say perhaps Radiotopia will go back once a year and ask for money or something or, like that. Or, or maybe some other kind of... Well, that's what I'm wondering. What the next question was, yeah. what, would, what would these other things be? Subscription model? I mean, uh, what, what, what kind of things are you looking at? Well, I think we're all on the same page trying to figure this out. You know, there's the listener support. We are also having um, advertising, uh, underwriting support. And then we also, because we come from the public radio world, there's a lot of foundation support that we're working with as well, maybe thematically for some of the programs. But I'm, I, I think this you know, crowdfunding thing, you've, there, there, there's still a lot to develop. I mean, Kickstarter was laughed at when it started. It was, it was 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. I mean, like photo books are one of my favorite things to support on Kickstarter. I mean, like, I feel like it's like pre-shopping. You've got a photographer saying that they're gonna do this project that you would you know, see in a bookstore later. And like the, it, yeah, there's, there's still a lot of amazing things that you can do with crowdfunding projects, I think, that 
that it's you know it's scary like I agree like that's that pile of money I, th we, I think we feel the same way we're like it's gone so well but you know now we're 10 you guys are talking about adding people too it's I don't know if it's sustainable and sort of like getting yourself started now the radiotopia is from what I understand listening to Roman Mars is also the money is going towards health insurance well, things like that yeah I mean so yeah. you know we're, we all have different levels of operations there's a few of us that are more independent organ like Radio Diaries and the Kitchen Sisters. They're sort of you know fully funded other otherwise members. But yeah, he's 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 offering health insurance. I mean, I'm 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 gonna get a paid. I'm starting a paid internship. A couple of us are. So yeah, there's there's some definite infrastructure uh, decisions we're getting to make thanks to the money. Have have any of you thought about uh, uh, partnering with uh, with academic institutions the way say Frontline does with Berkeley and. Other, you know, WGBH does with some places up in Boston. <laughs> we, we, part, we, we partner, um, we're, we're in a partnership with Rutgers University right now on a project, but we do it on project by project basis, not necessarily on the whole scope of, of the agency. I, I haven't thought about it for DECA, but I think it's a natural kind of partnership, and I don't know why. I mean, before DECA, I thought a lot about how we how journalism could get integrated into the academy, and I haven't like figured it out. But I don't understand why it hasn't happened more. There are little bits of things happening, but it's I can tell you one one of the reasons uh, my colleague Jay Rosen and I a number of years ago were trying to do this when uh, uh, what was it Steve Johnson's publication um, what was that called I can't remember Feed was going out of business, and we were trying to bring that into NYU and support that. Similarly with Lingua Franca, with Arts and Letters Daily. And the problem always came down to the lawyers, as most problems come down to, <laughs> was that they couldn't quite get their mind around the idea that you would have responsibility but not total ownership over one of these entities. I thought that the university press model was one that, that could be replicated along these lines. You know, you give housing and, 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 and some certain amount of stipend to these, uh, these places, but that didn't seem to work. Uh, but I'm always looking for ways, and that's one of the, and so, you know, this was an active question. I mean, you know, what are the ways in which you could see yourself, I mean, editors are basically talent scouts, and you're always looking for these young, hungry people, and, you know, universities uh, are full of them. So uh, I would encourage you to think uh, and try to work uh, you know, more with uh, that sort of thing. Well, there's Delphine, who's also here from DECA, writes, he's a, are you contributing editor at VQR, is that right? VQR is obviously, you know, that's that's university thing in some sense. I'm yeah. not sure how it works. Maybe you'll tell us. Have you thought about go, going on and bran branching out into other mediums? Because I mean, DECA is defining itself, and Mac and I were talking last night about this very much as a print publication with obviously with photo photographs, but not a multimedia, not like Atavis, say, or some other places. Uh, Radiotopia. Various podcasts are podcasts, and I'm sure there's you know the content on the site of non-audio content on the site. But have you thought about sort of breaking down those kind of kind of barriers, perhaps as a way to diversify and and grow? We just did a live night the other night, and that was kind of exciting. And, and obviously, and it seems like again, like musicians, the only money they're making are from live events or for mo for for most of them. So yeah, and, and I think. That might be something we could look into, but yeah, just sort of at the beginning of that. I'll say, having tried to do radio before, in fact, with Benjamin once, there's a reason that at least us print people are going to have a hard time doing that ourselves. And, and so it, it, we do want to do audio books, for instance. That, that's a, a no-brainer. But for us ourselves to be producers of the stuff, stretching us a little bit too thin, and we're not going to be very good at it. And so there's that, that question, you know, we want to, the reason we started this was to do the stuff we want to do without too much crap in the way. And there has been plenty of crap, but it's a different kind. You know, I just always think about the ways that these mediums seem to be sort of all seeping towards each other. And, and uh, certainly I, I, I acknowledge your comment that, you know, the simple-minded notion that everyone will be able to do everything is just this sort of this corporate fantasy. But, you know, maybe the 10th or 12th you know, member of DECA would be uh, someone who's doing audio and you know, and maybe the next Radiotopia thing would be, you know, someone who's, who's uh, taking some of these stories and doing a print or something. I'm just always curious about that. 
But the busking model is, I think, as you're saying, is, is a very attractive one. As you say, musicians make most of their money from you know, playing live and selling t-shirts if they can get a percentage of the merch. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. Yeah. What, does that work? I mean, is that something that you guys are exploring? Sure, I mean, uh, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go as far as to say that the only money that musicians make is from doing live shows, but um, I think that it's important to convince people <laughs> that you're providing something that's a valuable service to them or it's of value to them and if you can do that then people will want to support your work you know so I think that as far as how to make money what we've found has been the most important factor is just creating things that are actually valuable to people and then they will buy them um, and I don't think that there's really any way around that but but I think it's bigger than just a specific medium like part of the reason that we've done so much branching out from medium to medium is because we're not driven by, we're driven by an ideal, you know, and that's uh, much bigger than, you know, um, making, you know, putting audio onto a recording and giving it to someone. It's, uh, it's you know, we're, we're driven by our, our concepts and our convictions and that drives us to get involved in all different types of things, you know. So I think that that's kind of a, the more important factor there is what's, what's driving what you're doing and how, what are the best ways that that can arrive at the people that you want to target. And that changes over time, you know. I think that we've obviously seen that and that's why there are collectives now <laughs> that are kind of taking the place that corporations used to be in. You might want to explain to this mostly journalistic crowd what you guys do. Uh, yeah, well, I think I, I described it a little bit, but um, Mason Jar Music, it's, it's a collective. It's kind of an artist commune at this point where uh, a handful of artists live, share equipment, and support each other's work. And I think that that's more important than the things we create, in a sense. A wise friend recently told me that um, the reason why artists and business people or creative people and business people are often in conflict is that business people are always trying to minimize risk whereas artists need to maximize in order to serve their work. And uh, I think that <coughs> what's cool about collectives and you know a big part of our success story is that it's not based on the bottom line as a company has to be you know by, by nature or uh, you know, as a corporation has to be by nature, it's based on people with a mutual respect supporting each other's work, and that's so much more powerful than trying to get money. You know, money will arrive, at least in our experience, that's the way it's worked. <laughs> From your lips. Do you, um, <laughs> yes. J just to add something, um, while at Seven we're not adding like a radio person or, or a print person, we are, uh, a, a great believer in collaborations and partnerships. And with that idea that not one person can do everything, instead of us trying to sort of reinvent the wheel within ourselves, it, we are going out and finding the right people to, to partner with. So maybe DECA and Seven will do something together, or maybe Radio Utopia and Seven will do something together, something like that to kind of maximize both our audiences and both our skill sets. Yeah, I agree. I just wanted to say we've been talking with folks um, both on the visual side and also in, in the radio world about partnerships. So I think that may make more sense for us than like having somebody within the collective who does that work. Oh. I was just to say I also wanted to, uh, Tyler, talking about institutions before we, we got started sort of hearing about, you know, I think some, at least on the radio side, so much of us are fleeing we're, like, we're really excited about these new opportunities, but there's still, I think, on the print side, there still are some kind of amazing institutions where you still seem to have maybe better luck with, with, with what's yeah, going on. Tyler, you were mentioning so before, briefly about some of the things you're doing yeah, at Esquire. Uh, I'm from an 81-year-old co-op. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, hearing you talk about money and all that stuff, and I agree with you in a lot of ways, but you know, a lot of what I've been doing lately is trying to figure out ways is actually figure out how to, like, pay writers the amount they should get. And that means I gotta make money with, with what they're doing. Um, and so we've, you know, for the last four or five months been kind of made a real effort to actually um, almost have, I guess, an internal co-op culture, I guess you could say, 
Um, and it was funny, we actually met over the summer and, and with uh, Vanessa too about a lot of what they're working on with uh, kind of a new model of, of selling stories and supporting journalism. And I'm going through a lot of, of the same challenges at Esquire. Um, but the difference is um, the stories themselves you know, we have a whole system in place. And I have a managing editor who's gonna say, Tyler, where's your story? I need this. And I have Bob Scheffler, the wonderful research director, who's gonna say, ah, we need some work on this. And I have a copy team. I have all these things, which is really wonderful for the stories, so that when I'm also working on these other issues, which means, uh, you know, putting up, we've been doing a lot with paywalls lately. We did a couple paywall experiments, and right now we're working on building a, you know, a new, um, premium website that really actually will experiment in all different ways on um, will you pay for an article, will you watch an ad for an article, can we get a corporation to sponsor six different kinds of articles, I mean what can we do to actually figure out new ways of bringing money and I have no idea what's going to work but um, you know we have the opportunity and the space to try those things and to fail in those things because I know the actual quality is going to be taken care of and I think that's um, it's, it's a big difference, and so even just when we're talking about, you know, single stories and marketing and how to sell something and a number of bestsellers here and there, I'm in the middle of that mess. I mean, I just, um, you know, we're launching a new story in two weeks um, behind a paywall, and, you know, my last three weeks have been figuring out, okay, what are the, you know, can I get, and this is one actually wonderful thing about not being in a co-op, is um, so can I have every Hearst newspaper in the country put a, the first thousand words online? Oh, wait, I can, that's, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> okay, um, but then, okay, beyond that, you know, can we find the 30, um, you know, people on Twitter with the biggest followers that follow space? Can we send them a free copy? You know, all these other aspects that get very complicated. Can we get the writer, Chris Jones, to go on Reddit? Uh, can we do X, Y, Z? And that takes a phenomenal amount of work, and it's only been that this is my third or fourth time doing this that I realize that, because all the focus is typically on the story, and then all the focus is on the design, on the pretty design. And then the focus is on the, the, the paywall and how it works. And then you hit publish, and then no one comes to look at it. And I'm at Esquire. So that's you know, a real challenge, I think, that a lot of places, and I think you guys are, are facing, because um, it's really hard to find people. And that's one of the things about the digital world um, you know, I started this whole kind of experimenting two years ago with just anthologies of the greatest Esquire stories, you know, Gay Talies and, and Tom Wolfe, and you come out in, in an e-book and you get a great press release and everyone talks about it, and then three days later, nothing. The, the paywall question, do you find that, um, so let's say if like DECA was to start thinking about paywalls, would they be having sort of the same conversations that you're having? In other words, since you're in an institution, are they thinking of the paywalls differently than say someone start, like if you were outside doing the same thing? I'm, I'm fascinated by paywalls. <laughs> you know, I, actually yeah. not. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I'm kind of, no. I mean, w in, within our institution at least, they're thinking of how does this work? Could this actually possibly be sustainable? And let's figure out if it can be. And so no one, I mean, that's kind of the wonderful, beautiful magic of this day in, in journalism is that it is beyond exciting. I mean. You can do anything now. Um, there are no rules, and you can start a co-op, and you can your own magazine, and you can go off and do whatever you want, and that's like really fucking cool. Um, but we also don't know what the hell we're doing, and no one at all knows what's gonna work. So, you know, we all gotta stumble together. I, I will say one thing that was explicitly part of, of DECA was that we don't need to make as much money as you guys do. <laughs> and that was, but really, I mean, we don't need, we, there is no one but us. All the money comes to 10 people. That's how it works. It comes in, it gets dispersed. Now, we do have some expenses, but you know, we're a bunch of freelancers. So I don't know if it's going to work, but I think the kind of money we need to make this sustainable is different than legacy media. Stop having so many babies, and I think it'll probably yeah, right. things go a lot farther. I would just say one more thing. I mean, part of why I wanted Tyler to be on this panel is that we talked in the summer, and he kind of raised the question, well, can, can writers really edit each other? Is this really like, don't you need an actual editor? Because you're just, you know, you're just like 
reporters, and aren't you just, you know? So, um, which I, I thought was really was just. Well, well, no, no, but right, but like we don't, you know, are, are we really qualified to do that? And I think that's a fair question. And like you, you know, I want to talk about that. And I, I sort well, of so uh, maybe I'm you guys, words in your no, mind. but when. Um, when they sent me an email a few days ago or last week about, and it's like, can you talk about you know one good experience when you actually like collaborated well with a writer that was, and I was like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, I actually have the same rules, like no assholes, right? And so you know, when I work on a story, it's really collaborative, you know. I mean, if it's not, then I don't really want to work with the writer, and I mean that's kind of part of our process. But um, also part of that process is you know having this deep innate trust with a writer that you're both working on the story and it's, it's all you're both gonna focus on and Guinness for Right is the most important and they know I'm gonna be there at any time over that month or two months or three months while they're working on it and they're gonna be there too. And I pulled a lot of all-nighters with writers and there's a very strong trust, um, which means that when we're done and even if we've gone through seven drafts together, that isn't me rewriting at all. That's me discussing with the writer back and forth, and it's still all of their words in the end. Um, but for me, that, that's actually editing. And sometimes you can do it in one draft, sometimes it takes 10 drafts. Um, I think where I was coming from was I find it really hard to tell a friend that their writing sucks and they need to do it for the sixth time again. And I also find it really hard to tell a friend that their ideas suck. And you know, sometimes it's helpful to be able to say, you know what? The editor in chief hates it, but actually, you know, I hate it. But I got to blame it on somebody else, and we're not going to do your idea. And you know, it, it's uh, editing is hard. Writing is even harder. And um, I don't know. I think it's it's hard to do it well when you're just you know friends and hanging out all the time. Yeah, check. Okay, on all of that. So that's like really. I will say that when you talk about. I have a copy desk, and I have editors, I have a managing editor, and I have an editor in chief, and I can, we would, that's something we really have struggled with um, in our short life. We, like, all get together on email or on a Google chat, and it's, it is like anarchy. It's like everybody has an idea, and there are some problems with being straight with people about what you think when you don't feel like their work is ready for publication. And we are, those are real issues for us. So, so what, what is the decision making process? I mean, I, I went to a Quaker <laughs> school where everything is decided by consensus. Is that, is that, does that work? It's sort of like that. Um, I don't think we've gotten it figured out yet to where we want it to be. The way it works now is, um, let's see, there's, First, there was a lot of uh, uh, upset. So everybody gets assigned an editor for for each story um, that you know. Each writer in the collective um, is assigned an editor to work with on that story. And the way our first story worked, and Mac was the editor, Mara was the writer, Mara Vistendal in China, and they um, worked together a lot. And then they brought a, a a draft that was pretty far along to the rest of us, and we gave feedback. That's about how it worked, right? And then there were more revisions and more of of those two working together. Our second story, the process was very different. It actually really was edited by everyone. Um, and now we sort of think that this editing by committee thing, which is, is like something that was spoken about um, as a horror in the beginning by, by at least some of our members, and I think is believed by all of us to be potentially like horrible, is now something that we think may actually work well because if you, it turns out if you put a story up in a Google Doc and everybody can kind of feed off the comments that others make, they're, they're, instead of everybody having a different idea, you do begin to get some cohesion in the comments. And it turns out you can really get somewhere with that. You're um, making me cry inside right now. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, if, if, I was, if I was a writer, I mean, if this happened uh, at, um, at Esquire, if you were writing for me and, and you wrote an article and then I gave you some notes and then we got a draft back and then I sent it on to somebody else and then they disagreed with my changes and then I had to tell you, well, I, I think this, but I, they, they want that. And then it goes to somebody else. And then what happens is no one has any ownership over it. So that when it actually is just kind of meh, because everybody wants to make sure they have their voice in it, no one really cares anymore because it's not their story. Um, that, that's the worry. I, I've just gone through this, actually. Mark is my editor on, on the draft I just mostly handed in, depending on how you call it that. And, and I've had some comments back from the others. The key might just be the power dynamic. 
Mark has the power to not pass the comments along. And, and I have the power to ignore the ones I think are stupid. And because we're all equals in this thing, that's a little bit more power. I'm not sure how it's really going to work, but I can say that there were some things that were said that were harsh, not from Mark, who was ready to go with the draft, that I thought were brilliant. And, and Vanessa had some thoughts that were really smart that I, I think you were already working on them, but I hadn't seen them from Mark yet. And you know what? It was better. It was weird. And I, I am, <laughs> I've been edited by like six people before, and I know what you're talking right. about is the worst thing. It, it might be um, responsibility, yeah. because when it's a writer, and an, like, so for, for, for instance, now, right now, when I, when I assign a story, I mean, the way we work at Esquire is a uh, story gets approved, the idea get, get, gets approved by the editor in chief. After that, he doesn't read it, no one reads it until it's actually into the system. So no one else messes with me and my writer, and that's it. Which means that if the story sucks, I'm in big trouble, especially because I usually go and I say, no, the story's gonna be amazing, we have to try this writer out, it's just gonna be the best story ever. So it means there's a responsibility. And maybe what you're saying is that by kind of not talking, you know, that editor, main editor still has responsibility even though they're kind of getting ideas from other people. No, I was going to say, it's, a, it's the relationship power dynamic thing, for sure. I mean, I, so in the radio world, all of the failed journalists from print and TV have, like, come into public radio over the last... <laughs> I'm not joking. It's not funny, either. But, like, at the big stations at, in Washington, really, like, there's just levels of editors that have come. So in a way, there's kind of, like, a process and a chain of command, but it's, in a way, it's also that no ownership. There's, like, a, it's a terrible, terrible process. And I think that, for us, one of the exciting things about moving away, and, not, and, and, and it's not just Radiotopia, there's a lot of public radio people who are moving out of the system and trying all of these great new ventures that are coming out of, because of podcasting. But I think that that editing relationship, what you guys are doing with DECA sounds really exciting to me. There, but, uh, but it's because you all know each other, like it's, and it's small. Like you c really, I mean, there is, even though the, the failed print and failed TV <laughs> journalists are doing terrible things, there, there needs to be these structures. Like, I understand that they're there. Like, I, I, it's not all their fault. But at the same time, I think uh, uh, trying to build these new ones, it's, I don't know how, yeah, I, when you have a great editor, it just makes the story better. It's like, I, you know, I miss my editor sometimes when I worked at the station, for sure. Ron, sorry, when you guys are doing, when you're putting out stuff under the Seven brand, what's that mean? Like, do you, are you looking over each other's shoulders at all? Uh, on collective group projects, there's usually the, the there's somebody managing it who's in collaboration with the other photographers editing it. We're like we're editing. Uh, uh, we have a book coming out next year with Fiden, so we're working on the edit together. There are two of us who are editing for the entire the entire agency. Uh, it's a little bit um, more. I think photographers are a little more used to on group projects for being a little bit more um, flexible. But on individual, like this photographer's photo essay, it's in control of that photographer. I have, I have a question. Uh, one of the things I would say is that this has never been a better time to get your work published, whatever medium you're in, but it's also been never been harder to get anyone to pay attention. There's so much noise about it. Uh, Esquire is, has the advantage of being this very old brand, coming out once a month, having a huge billboard, um, how do you, who don't have that, how do you get attention for your, for your stuff? I mean, how do you break through the noise, whether it's in audio or in written? I mean, what are, what are the, I mean, social media is one thing, but I mean, what, 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 what kind of methods are you doing? It seems that funding is only part of it. You've got this black box, you've got to sort of figure out how to get people to watch or listen to it. The collective thing is just super powerful. And in fact, when Roman and I were first talking about this, I said, it could be like comic books, or you have the superhero crossovers. So you have like, <laughs> and, it's, and I'm not joking, like lo look what Disney and Marvel are doing. They're making bazillions of dollars with the same. So we did like a, a series last, a few months ago, I shouldn't even say this, but uh, you'll turn that off. Oh, no, anyways. <laughs> but um, we decided to do a group theme, but we'd all kind of, we're too far along this, we're really coordinated, so we just called it a group theme. And boom, we were listed on all of like the podcast services, like, oh, the Radiotopia group theme, and we just made it up. So, but imagine if, so like the, the, the aggregators pay attention to that. And there's something about the power of a collective, like the Avengers, like that movie made a lot of money and it was just, you know, the strategy of bringing the different pieces together. There's something, I think, that if attention is the currency, which it is now, then 
this collective thing that DEC is trying, that we're trying, I, I think we could, get, we could go far with it. So it's pa packaging. It's branding. It's what? It's branding. Yeah, branding. I mean, that's, that's one, I mean, for us, and we've been criticized for it and complimented for it, but it's this idea that what you create, what DECA is creating, what Seven's created, what Magnum has created, is a brand that represents X and that people, when they see that name attached to this project, will say, okay, that's a little bit more than looking at somebody's Instagram feed or Flickr feed or whatever. It's, it's the next level or uh, hopefully a few levels up. And that's, that's the idea when you collaborate and create with like-minded like partners of a, high, of a high quality. But when you get into the, say, branding Radiotopia, which I, I was described to me as sort of the indie radio thing, don't you then fall into the same problem that, say, NYC and NPR has, or, or e within NYC individual shows, if you're branding Radiotopia, then does that take away from the individual shows and vice versa? I think if we grew very big, yeah, it might. But I think staying sort of, you know, now we're 10, I, I think around this level we should be okay. I mean, what's also a little different though is the radio dial is you have to put some people on at 3 a.m. because not everyone can be on it during Brian Lair. Whereas with podcasts, we don't have that problem. Like we can actually grow and we can all sort of be at the same level. No one will be on at midnight. <laughs> Mind if I add something like the the um, Vanessa had to go take care of her child, so um, I I think part of this the branding thing, I, and I'm sorry if this sounds pejorative, but I've been told as a writer now for a good four or five years that I have to build my personal brand brand, and there are people in fact building their personal brands, uh, doing like talks about how to build other people's personal <laughs> brands, and and I find it distasteful. It's not that I. I think I'm above spending my life on Twitter and all of that kind of stuff, but I've been told this over and over and over. I, but what does that really create? Fundamentally, we're in the business of journalism. We're not just selling widgets. In theory, there's a public good here somewhere. And so if I have to build my personal brand of Mark so that I can compete better with the personal brand of Mac so that my story about Span Spanish politics can compete better with his story about Alaskan environmentalism. It's zero sum, and we're going to give one or the other to the audience. And then if I do my brand really well, I get to have coffee with Ron, the award-winning photographer, and I get his picture, and Mac does. And then, and on and on and on. And I'd much rather brand in a different way. I'd much rather say, Mac and I are under one brand, and our brand can go to Ron's brand, and then Together, we can go to Radiotopia and we can get some interesting soundtrack music and then we can show up at Tower Shop and take all his money. <laughs> <laughs> that feels That's much all you better. are, a pile of money, Mr. <laughs> and, well, um, I think that's a business model right there. <laughs> like, like that's news, here we are, man. <laughs> I mean, come on. And, but I mean, I'm being somewhat facetious, but my point is the whole branding exercise makes sense only to me in terms of partnerships. Whether that's partnerships between me and Mac and Vanessa and Delphine to cover the world, or if it's partnerships between people who do necessary things better than we can do them, like take a photograph. And you know, that yeah. doesn't seem like, that seems like kind of a no-brainer to me, honestly. It's or what or put more about. succinctly, I have like 30 Twitter, for Twitter followers and Sonia has 25,000 or something like that. Put all those together and, and anything you do has more reach. Full yeah. stop. And that's sometimes it's that simple, is that ten people are louder than one person. But that's what happens when Sonia wants to have another kid and do it on her own? Or like, have you, do you guys ha have conversations like that? I mean, because again, say we're now streaming a discussion <laughs> of Sonia yeah. having children. <laughs> Sorry, Sonia. Oh. Well, yeah, it, we've actually already said you know we need to build in book leave and kid yeah. leave. And some of the biggest stresses, honestly, we've had timing-wise have been related to Vanessa and I both had kids, and, and we didn't have enough people to keep the thing going without, with two people down. And so we, need, we think we might need a few more people or some sort of mechanism, but we haven't figured out what that means. And if she leaves, and this has been good for her, you know, that's, that's what happened. I mean, you've, you've had photographers come and go, and I think that's, having been part of Seven, has been great for them, and, and leaving has maybe been the right choice when they do, and that's the nature of the thing, I guess. It's not concerning, particularly, unless everybody goes. More, more to the point, sk skills aren't necessarily even, right? I mean, we're both good journalists, but 
he understands the tech stuff much better than I do. You know, Delphine speaks French, I speak Spanish. These are all useful things that we don't have together and we'd have to hire out under our personal brands. I don't have the money to do that, you know? I guess if I could ask a question though, I think what really happens with the collaborations is you start figuring out what people know how to do administratively. I mean, we're a group of 10 writers. I'm pretty sure if you gave us a hot dog stand out on third, we'd run into the ground in a week and a half. <laughs> so like, like seven was just a group of photographers, right? Or did you have a business mind in the mix somewhere beyond what you already knew? We had one person that was reasonably good that maybe we could have kept the hot dog stand going for two weeks. <laughs> uh -huh. And yet 13 years later, you're here. So how did that happen? It's hard. And, and it really, and I think some of the things, like when I tweeted about this, I said some of the reasons to build a co-op and some of the reasons not to because there are uh, some serious downsides to it, especially when journalists, photographers who are not trained in business, who really should have very little to do with the running of the business, <laughs> um, especially like after that you know, startup period, you're successful, and then it's time to hand it off to somebody that actually knows what to do. And, and we've been mishanding off for quite, quite a while. It's, it's difficult. It's also, we found this real difficulty where what's good for you as a photographer is not necessarily good for you as an owner of a business. And those things can really clash because you might have to make decisions based on the business structure that don't benefit you as an individual. And so the idea of self-sacrifice for the greater good can often be a problem. And these are things that you will hopefully not experience, but if you do, it's things to be uh, wary of and it's things that are very, co it's, it's human nature and the way things go. How, when you look back at your history and that particular struggle, how many times has it ended in the person getting angry about the self-sacrifice and leaving or how many times, versus how many times has it ended where people really work through that to stay together? Uh, more times than, than not people have stayed and because they realize the power of what we're trying to do um, in the sort of the collective good and then also they have to, I mean some photographers have to say, okay, if I leave my career will do this and it might be fine, or it's better to remain with, with my colleagues and, and build my career from within. And that's a very individual decision. And there are also journalists, photographers who are, they're not business people, and they, they're, they're responsibilities, and when you have a co-op, you have to take responsibilities, and that often is you know, left brain, right brain stuff going on, uh, which is definitely can be a clash. How do you guys, you get some money, presumably, so you say, Sure. And how do you split it up? What's it do? How does that all work? Um, well, our model is, I guess, somewhat unique in that no one's uh, salaried. Everyone's just paid based on a, a project basis. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, that's the answer to that question, and I'll comment on what was recently said, uh, which is that I feel like you're right, like a, being in a collective really requires sacrifice and a lot of times that's kind of counter-evolutionary to, you know, to our instincts. But I think if the mission is compelling enough and, and people are, as you said, able to recognize something bigger than themselves, you know, the greater good and the good of the collective, then you know, stand a chance at actually surviving and I think that that's kind of what it requires. In addition to, as you also said, people learning new skills, like you know, in a collective of writers, Someone's going to have to bend and learn how to do X, or you know, learn learn how to run QuickBooks or l design a website or something. You know, it's it's just uh, the nature of it, and I think it's kind of the wild west, but um, that's also what's exciting. The problem is, it's a market, and we're bad at those things. Yeah. So, we, like, we, we I made our video, and I really wish somebody who knew something about video had made it. Say you, for example. <laughs> we might be really lucky at Radiotopia because there's another partner we have. So. Um, there's an organization called the Public Radio Exchange, PRX, which is you know uh, a decade over a decade old and in the system and run um, by Jake Shapiro, who's the CEO, who's just one of the greatest minds in the public radio system, I think, right now. And he, even all of his team, they're you know running. They're they're our partner, so we're we're, we're with them. We're part of PRX. So they so they do your business. Back Not only all the business, but there's a uh, we're they're a visionary too. They're part of the whole. You know, Roman was working at PRX for, you know, another job before he started um, his show. Uh, all of us have been working with a lot of us with Jake for for years. 
So I think like having that infrastructure built in is, but at the same time, I think that what might be good for the collective, you know, the public radio exchange is a whole other platform as well. It's sort of an exchange for independent radio producers to get their stuff on public radio stations. So this is ver something very different. So whether it, you know, is this a distraction for them? Is this maybe a way forward for them? There could be some problems down the road, but for the moment, it's, you know, I don't know if we'd survive as, as 10 radio producers on our own, to be frank. Yeah, we would just be on fire already. <laughs> are are you guys all in New York? Okay. Are you guys all in New York? No, no, PRX is in Boston, Roman's in San Francisco, I'm here, Leah's in LA, we're all, all over. We are everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we throw it open to questions? I know they're, the audience, uh, I'm sure, has some questions for individuals. Yep. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm curious about, uh, first of all, like how, what is the right size for a co-op? I mean, Magnum has dozens or hundreds of photographers. <coughs> These co-ops are obviously smaller. Do you think there's a, like an optimal size? And in the case of Decca, uh, what's the issue with exclusivity? Do your writers write only for you? Is there any way to write for them to write for other people? How, how do you make sure basically everyone is contributing the same amount? Uh, since, since there's the Decca part, I guess I'll start. Uh, for us, we jokingly said for a while, how, how big is a Google Hangout? How many little heads can you get in one? I think the answer was eight when we started. And it's now 10, and it doesn't matter because it turns out no one's ever awake at the same time. And everyone's always on email too much. So, um, but I, I do think that we're not, we can't grow much past this, at least not with our current structure, just because maybe we can get to 12, 13, 14, but any bigger than that, it's already, it's already a little bit heavy if everyone weighs in. And I think we have a lot of managerial, managerial stuff to figure out, period, since we're so new. But that there will be a cap. And we've, we've often talked. At first, we wanted to do, what, six? I mean, we were, yeah, it was, we, were, we were thinking less than 10. And then we said, oh, maybe a little bit bigger will be weightier. But I do think it has a, a already you can see the institutional problems if everyone has an equal vote. And I, I don't know if having maybe an apprentice like the, some of the photo agency have done, have sort of an apprenticeship, basically, and then join as a full member. It would be different as, as Magnum. I don't know, does Seven do that? No. no. So uh, as for exclusivity, absolutely not. You know, the, the only, the stories themselves, DECA has the rights to them for a long period of time. I think, I can't remember what it's in our contract, but it's, it's years. No, no, not at all. Uh, we're all we're all freelancers working for magazines. Some of us are working on on books, and the idea was that this would not take over our lives. It would be if you've got one story that you just want to do and you want to do it really long and do it well. Here's a way to a get it paid for in large part because we we pay half expenses right now and hopefully we'll get to full expenses, and then here's a place where you can publish it, and and hope that we'll, it'll have an audience that um, we are not against, in fact, we're, we're already talking to some old, very old media about placing stories as, as the photo agencies have always done. It's like, you know, you take your photos and you're not just publishing it yourself, you're placing it somewhere. For us to place an important story in, on five continents and major existing print magazines, there's not a bad model at all, in addition to publishing it ourselves to a longer length. So we, but right now, we each sign up for one story, and we each sign up for one edit a year. Full stop. Other questions? Well, I can just add something to the, uh, the number, because we started, number seven was pretty specific, because we wanted to, we thought we wanted a number where people could sit around a table, and then once we got past, we th our charter was never to be more than 12 or 13, because we thought, just by human nature, clicks start to form after that, which becomes, can be very destructive. But then the reality of business comes in and the reality of people's lives, people move into different things, different. So now we're, we're 20 photographers, of which 15 are, are very active. Magnum is over 60 photographers. And so these are other things that, like there's the reality of enough stories, enough income, people go off, do a book, go teach, whatever, and then all of a sudden you don't have enough product coming in to to sell, and you have to figure out what that balance is. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have a question for Tyler, though, because you know, thinking about um, some of the collectives, you know, like I said, so we have PRX, we have some help 
on sort of the business end, but what kind of uh, uh, sort of support, you know, when on the sort of being this sort of skunk work, this operation inside of Esquire, do you have bus business visionaries sort of ima helping you imagine like how to support this with the advertising and sort of like with on the other economics, not just with paywalls? Or do you have to figure that out stuff too yourself? I have to figure it out myself. Um, I mean, the answer is, is honestly really no. I mean, um, I think part of that is just the structure of legacy um, media, or at least journalism, where you know I'm a, a print editor. I mean, I should not even be up here discussing monetization. That's really just like not allowed, you know. Um, but I think it dawned on uh, on us, and, and I think it dawned on a lot of people that um, you know I'm up here talking about this because actually that's my passion, right? My passion is like amazing stories. And it seemed that if we wanted to keep doing and making a sustainable model, then as we had to do that, we had to actually do it ourselves on the editorial side because everyone else is just busy doing what, what we've always done. And part of that is keep, you know, selling ads, doing everything you have. And, you know, part of, you know, what's, um, one of the things that's made um, this possible, at least my position now, is that a lot of my responsibilities as an editor have kind of been pushed aside. And they said, you know what, just focus on this. And you go and, and you talk, I mean, in terms of you know, new ideas, I mean, a lot of what we're doing now is like going to other places, and whether it's speaking, talking with Jake at PRX or elsewhere and, and doing collaborations, because we don't have all those new ideas, and we know that. So we need to go out and kind of find that. But I guess what I was saying is, that also takes the ability to actually uh, to have the freedom to go do that because our ad sales staff is busy selling ads for the actual magazine, right? And our writers are busy writing. And it's really hard to try to experiment and innovate in real time when you're also on deadline on a story and you also need to sell something to, to get the actual magazine out. You have to do everything. So um, if I, if I uh, pay for an installment of DECA, um, am I a co-op member, at least at some mm -hmm. level? If, and if not, why not? Because I kind of, I, 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 I kind of question a little bit, without going into deeply, uh, in, in your notion of like not scaling, uh, because I think scale is what gets you um, buy-in. Yeah. Well, we, and this wasn't just gloss. We did want more. I mean, we're selling direct to readers, then yeah, you want that direct relationship. Do you want to call it a co-op member? I mean, does that mean you write with, for us, with us? No, but I mean, I suppose you could. I think about it, like REI, for example. Mm -hmm. like, I could like, buy a coded REI or something, or, but like, if I pay $20 a year, I could become a member of the co-op. Like, and then I get like voting rights, and I get, uh, and at some nominal level, it doesn't mean I get to like choose the color of the logo, or you know, yeah. You know, the one, you know, we, the, the, the uh, matter, you know, a great Kickstarter launch that happened had that, that idea. If you join us in Kickstarter, you get to vote on our upcoming coverage. And, I, and they said it was one of the things that they, they raised much more than we did. And, and their project has changed quite a bit. But one of the things that really worked well about it was that buy-in and the direct connection with readers. I'm not sure if... Uh, if we weren't visionary in that regard, we, but we just didn't fully go there. We set up a page, a, a part of our website where we say, please send us your ideas. We're actually reading all these emails. And you know, it's not hard to contact writers anymore, but if we've got people all over the world and we've got this form on the website where you go there, here's the idea, why is it uncovered? We've gotten a bunch of emails. We got one just, I don't know if you saw that one, one from Niger that just came in yesterday. It was about you know this Italian company in Niger yeah. cover this, yeah. and that we do want that. We didn't fully, we weren't sure what it would mean beyond that to, you know, be a backer, be a supporter. We'll talk to you, but maybe you have some better ideas on this. I, I mean, fundamentally, I agree with you on some level. I and we're somewhat spitballing here, but I think it's a resources question on some level. We're starting. As we were, I mean, we were joking about the hot dog stand, but it's true. We're we're 11 people trying to do uh, all of the jobs that are sitting here, and we're good at like three of them. And there's 36 that we have to do. Uh, we would like to do that 
how do you set up, uh, you know, what, is, what does it mean to be a member? Well, it means that you get to do stuff. Okay, where do you get to do that stuff? Can we build the room where you get to do that stuff? Maybe it might be kind of ugly. It, do we want to build it if it's ugly, or do we want to wait six months until we can get somebody who knows how to build that room? There's that conversation. The other conversation is, well, uh, we were in, me and another, another person who wasn't here tonight, Stefan, in Rome, were invited to a conference in Perugia uh, that wa in Italy where the theme very much was about this changing model of journalists make and readers take. So I write a thing, hopefully it's good, and I give it to you and you consume it, and it's this one-way you know, restaurant thing. And the whole theme of this conference was that's done, that's gone, let's not do that anymore. And I really, really liked that idea of, of let's not hang our thing on the wall and, uh, and if you give me some money, you get to look at it, you know? Um, but not liking that relationship and figuring out what the new relationship is is a, is a hard thing to do for a bunch of people who are trying to write 10,000 word stories, edit them, and sell the notion at the same time. So, yes, but not now is maybe my answer. Um, this may have been touched on a little bit, but I'm curious about it in terms of seven particularly. I don't know how often you guys acquire new members, but when you do, I'm curious if you have to reconcile in some ways um, a photographer's personal identity versus their identity as a seven photographer? Do they have to kind of choose one or do they develop both simultaneously? Is there ever a conflict? I mean, does the collective basically take over the individual? Right. Are we the Borg? Yeah, is he like <laughs> the, you know, as a, as a person then the seven photographer or, uh, but also their, you know, specific no, it's very much the individual photographer that's who we're, who we want to be associated with, and they can take on the seven identity or brand, as you like to say, to enhance what they're doing. Um, and there are times when, yes, we are a collective and we produce a project for Doctors Without Borders or something that goes into National Geographic, but most of the interaction of that photographer and the world is the photographer's name slash seven. It's not seven slash the photographer's name. What, what is the process? How, do you approach people anymore, or do they basically find you? It's Bribes are a pretty big part of it. Um, <laughs> no, it, it, it's a combination. Uh, we, when we decide that it's time uh, to look for new membership, we put out a call, we do portfolio reviews, uh, and then if there are photographers out in the world uh, that, we want, that we think would be a good addition to us, we would ask them to, to apply uh, we also have a mentorship program where we take uh, young photographers um, from countries where there's not a lot of sort of <coughs> photographic exposure and education and bring them in for two years to kind of raise, to raise them up. Uh, and then kind of the same thing that you guys said, the personality is, is actually very important because you are becoming an owner and a partner. And so it could be the most amazing photographer in the world, but if he or she doesn't get along with people that are already existing at the agency, then it's just not going to work. Hi, uh, I'm a journalism student here at NYU. I'm actually one of Rob's students. And I'm realizing more and more lately that um, in the next five or 10 years, I'm probably going to be writing, working, producing in organizations, groups, mediums that don't exist yet, um, which is both exciting and kind of crazy to think about. But so I'm wondering if some of you could talk about kind of how you got to where you are today and where you see yourselves working in the next five or 10 years or kind of how that journey has been for you? Because I'm sure it's very different, but as somebody kind of in the middle of it, I'm very curious as to what that's like and what you think about for the future. Um, well, I can answer that for Mason Drum Music. Um, we started not too long ago, founded in 2009, 2009 or 10, and. Uh, it was basically, uh, as a lot of people have set up here, just based on uh, really deep mutual respect among people who created things and respect for each other's work and a desire to work together more frequently and consistently and to create a brand that's an insignia for a higher standard of quality than maybe what, you know, some of the things that were frustrating us at the time. So 
In our case, it was just a matter of uniting those people, creating some kind of a shared vision, and then executing it. And it, at first, um, a lot of spec work, like getting those people together and then creating a lot of things on spec, meaning not for money, but just uh, on the prospect of that maybe one day there could be money. And then really heavily branding and promoting that work and saying, this is, this is our vision for what things could be like. And if it existed, would people support us? And um, in our case, the answer ended up being yes. So this, is, this is multimedia, right? Not just That's right. If I, if I could add something to this, I'm, I'm, I don't want to speak for the group on this, because again, this sounds a little pejorative. But if the implied question is, where are you going to be in five years? I think one of my motivations in, in participating in our project is that after 20 years of work with uh, achieving, you know, whatever, I'm no household name, but I'm fine, I have a job, I do my, my thing, um, there's a vast instability. And I saw a lot of people I knew who had done remarkable work that had affected public policy, that had affected the communities they were living in, who were very, very concerned uh, that they didn't know whether they were going to be in 60 days or, or whatever. And um, so I'm in, in some way, a little frustrated and annoyed uh, that I can't answer your question. So part of my motivation is that you know it's very, very encouraging to me that there's a skunk works within Esquire. It is baffling to me that there isn't a skunk works that I'm aware of in every single legacy title. And I have asked editors at very large places, why don't you go out to Silicon Valley and go to Facebook and go to Google and go to Apple and Go to where people are making the thing, and, and the New York Times is doing this. You know, there's innovation out there, but as an industry, to me personally, it seems to me we watched music get run over by change, and we watched movies get run over by change, and we kind of just stood around and retrenched. And it, it annoys me that they don't go out to the Facebooks and headhunt and say to somebody, "Hey, you want to?" reinvent the book so that in 100 years they say Gutenberg and, you know, you. And they just haven't. And so we have to do this. And, and again, I, I, I stress I'm saying this personally, not for the group. It annoys me that we have to Kickstarter uh, and bootstrap this instead of going to any of those big buildings in Midtown we can all name and say, look, he writes for National Geographic. And <laughs> we kind of know what we're doing. Do you have a skunk works in the basement? Because I bet you we could build something really cool if we weren't spending all of our time trying to learn how to be lawyers and all of the rest. Of it. <laughs> so I, 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 I very much hope that the thing that doesn't exist yet that you're going to work at, maybe it'll look a little bit like what we're all building. And maybe it won't. Maybe you'll build it. But one question that I still ask is, why am I building this? Why am I not right now? It's because you're cranky. I'm on the cranky side, too. I'm cranky, too. too yeah, yeah, but no, like, me, me why too, am I not home reporting yeah, tonight? You I know, know no, no. But at the end of the day, it's, you could you know, sit at the bar and be cranky. I, I did this for many years, too. Like, I think the We're same thing in public radio guys. is that you know, watching all the failed print and TV journalists, I love saying that, come into <laughs> radio. <laughs> And just you know, kind of sit around. No assholes. We had a no assholes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so I think it, you can spend time trying to complain about that, or you yeah, can just absolutely. roll up your sleeves and work on a new models. And it's kind of fun and exciting. Totally. So, but yeah, it's it's also I I have that thought too sometimes. Like why why do we have to do this? Well, I guess the other thing to mention is that we're not as journalists we're not doing anything particularly new. Like the idea was to find a way to pay for the things we've always done and keep on doing that in a way that, that works. So in one sense, it's not reinventing, we're not inventing anything. Although if we do something like that, I'm going to make myself a really nice avatar. I know that much, <laughs> <coughs> especially as I age. But, but in the meantime, it, it's really not, I don't know that everyone needs to learn all new media. I don't think, in fact, most journalists should try to reinvent things. Uh, you know, maybe things will get figured out a little bit, but I still think that the best thing to do to do great journalism is not to is to let someone else figure this out. And I say this having answered a bunch of our customer service emails personally, <laughs> and um, and not you know not necessarily try to do this. Although maybe 
pay attention and see which one of us, which ones of us are still around. But I wouldn't, I don't think that every journalism student should also be a technology student. And I, believe me, I never thought I would ever do anything like this. It's not the tech that interests me at all. It's the, the model. It's the fact that the tech is an enabler. It's the fact that because of this press a button and you can publish thing, we can maybe find a way, and, and crowdsourcing, we can maybe find a way to do really old things, which is words on a page, whether digital or paper. So that, I, I wouldn't actually worry about it. Uh, isn't that maybe then an argument for integrating into your collective a couple forward-thinking developers so that you're not all photographers or writers, but you have your PRX? And then if that's the case, isn't there a different kind of superstructure that we need to be focusing on creating? It's not about creating these individual collectives, but about helping <coughs> that person from seven who has this kind of style and aesthetic find that person from DECA who has a really similar but written version of that aesthetic. And, and that's the superstructure that we should be trying to create, where people can connect across disciplines instead of within disciplines. That's Esquire magazine, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's one thing actually I was going to ask you guys that kind of, uh, of you know, gets in here is, um, you know, something about a magazine is it's a it's a vision, and it's a voice, and it's a curated experience. And um, you know, one question I had about Deca was how, you know, I guess what is a Deca story? You know, I, I don't know. You know, and I think if you open whether or not you like Esquire or not, you know somewhat what you're getting. And I think that helps you find a readership that actually says, no, I want this because it's it's great journalism or it's entertaining or it's both rather than I want this because I want to support journalism. And my gut is actually be fully sustainable. Um, any enterprise has to kind of, you know, it's great to get support, people want to support you, but you got to be just good and they have to know what they're getting. And so, I know, do you guys have a vision for kind of what? We started leaning international and we defined international as not um, the opposite of domestic, but as global in the broad sense. I, I mean, not to answer your question with a question, but what is a life, what was a Life Magazine story? That's what a DECA story is. And okay. Life is still here with us, so no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, sorry, that was loud. Um, it's sort of a basic distribution question, which is to piggyback on something Max said a little bit ago, that you know a great thing for DECA would be to get a story placed in uh, international or national publication, some sort of larger publication. And it's a model that works for photography. I'm not sure if it works, um, Dan, if it works for music, Radiotopia, if it works for you guys. But I guess the question would be directly to Tyler. I mean, this is something that's worked a little bit for someone like ProPublica, placing stories in music. But someone like Decca shows up at your doorstep with a story, not having gone through your process, are you putting it in the magazine? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it actually is, is a very hard question. And it's, I mean, you know, we actually have talked, you know, a, about you know, a small amount, um, and I mean to answer your question, we we've done um, collaborations before with other people, um, with the Poulter Center. We've done a few things with, but the difference with them is that, I mean, they're kind of the wonderful angels of. of there he is. There's John Sawyer oh. right there. Oh hey John, um, <laughs> in that you know, there's a ton of stories I want to do that we just don't have the money for, and they believe in them, and they say, look, we will give you expenses for it and then they trust you and you edit the story as you would a regular Esquire story. And for us, that is amazing and it's, it's been life-saving, I think, for a lot of, of international journalists. Um, where it gets more complicated is if Mac were to write a story and it were to be edited and they have it on their vision, and then I get it, and it may be a great story, but you know, every magazine is different in terms of how we want, um, I wouldn't say a story structured, but, um, how I see stories being read, how much narrative I need, how much momentum I want. And what I wouldn't want is a story that someone else is right for DECA is probably not exactly right for Esquire. It doesn't mean that a DECA writer couldn't do it and we couldn't consult and kind of discuss how to make this right tonally for Esquire, but um, that's where it gets a bit complicated. You, you really can't just plug in you know, a story here and put it there. And I think that is one of the differences, I think, between 
you know, a photo co-op and versus writers. And I think that is one real challenge is that, um, you know, I tell even writers this when, when, they're, when they're looking to pitch, don't pitch me the same story you gave to Vanity Fair, to The New Yorker, to GQ. It could be similar topics, but the approaches are gonna be very different. And so that gets a little, a little hard. Yeah, and, and there is, however, a, a pretty good model that comes from publishing, which is all of us in decade, or most of us now, have uh, written a book, full-length book, and then you sell for serial rights. You take a chunk of that book and you make a magazine article out of it. And it's a little bit different if we have a 15,000 word story and you're selling 5,000 words of it, but we're talking to, to some national magazines about doing that very thing with some of our next stories. So it's, it's in fact possible to say, okay, here's our book, because what are these things? They're, they're not quite book and they're not quite article. So here's our book, would you like to excerpt it? And some people have said yes, because what's the, the value for, if, if Tyler says, no, this isn't for us, someone might want something that's been paid for, done, edited at least once, and has gone through some rigor, even if it's not the same rigor, the writer would maybe be happy to do that rigor again. And when you get, a, when you have a book serialized, that's what happens. You, uh, you can see some first serials that look very different than what the chapter was in that book. And so that, that's the idea is that we can do something like that and we're, we're uh, an email away from having our first one happening right now. So uh, I'm John Sawyer. I'm with the Pulitzer Center and Tyler gave me a bit of an opening. So I'd just like to come back to the point about the, the agency, what was said about PRX and the role that PRX plays. Um, and I, we think of ourselves at the Pulitzer Center as an agency that's promoting great journalism wherever we can. And, and I would not, and we work with Seven, we're working with DECA, we work with Tyler, and, and um, we work with lots of folks. And, and having been at this for about nine years now, uh, I would not underestimate the challenges of trying to set up a co-op that's going to be a business model and an agency uh, to serve the, 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 the goal of promoting and, and getting the work out um, of the great journalists who are represented here. And, uh, I'm a believer myself in sort of intermediary agencies that, that serve that purpose. And, 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 and we've sort of thought from the beginning that we don't want to, to reinvent wheels that are already there. We want to use legacy media. If we can get a great story in Esquire, we want to get it in Esquire. We want to use that platform. And, and if we can use social media to promote something that's being done by somebody else, we'll do that as well. But, but those are those are skills, and we're doing a lot of university and secondary school outreach because we're trying to, to keep, uh, keep the conversation going on all of the reporting that, that we're doing. But it's a, it's a long-term process to build. PRX has been at it for a long time, too, mm -hmm. and, and that's a, a specialized skill, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think that it's that easy to kind of replicate that, you know, co-op by co-op as you're, as you're setting up great new ideas. Just no, I'd, I'd say that's, that's all fair, very fair. The only, I suppose the only thing to, to say is that we're, we have a, another interest in doing this, is that as a magazine writer, you can have a great story that is like, I want to do this story for you, Mr. Magazine Editor, and they've got a similar story coming out in February, you want to do yours in December, sorry. It's actually not, it's actually, it's still a great story, it's just, it doesn't quite fit. In that case, I've had this happen, as any magazine writer has, then you don't know what to do. You don't have a, a place to do this great story you want to do. You don't want to go out on a limb because you don't have the money to do it. You know, I, as you know, I, I got money from you once to, to uh, do this very thing, and then I gave the money back because at the end it didn't work. I didn't find the place that, for the great story I wanted to do. And in, in one small way, if DECA gives you a platform to A, push this, and very worst case, you publish something, and you publish something you think is important, and I'm not saying like this is our slush bin by any means. I'm saying that sometimes it's just a, as a freelancer, it's a hard road to f talk to 10 different editors for this story you know is great. If we're the, the backup plan in addition to placing it, that's, that isn't our model now, but it's not a bad model if that's what we become in five years at all. Because there are a lot of these things, like we want to cover these stories uh, because we think they're important, but because it's hard being a freelancer. And so that's part of it too, is just 
being a, a single person out there floating around the world trying to put all these cogs together. If you're a collective and you're, you know, you're just easier, you don't have that problem. So one question for all of you guys. You talk about sort of the challenge of attention and the sort of idea you hit publish and the rock goes into the pond and the ripples dissipate and no one pays any attention to it. Um, do you guys see in this sort of changing landscape that, that it's almost a zero sum game, that you've got this fixed attention span. So if someone's going to the Esquire site, they're not spending time on the GQ site, or if someone's going to DECA, or is this something that there is room for everyone, or does it come at the expense of something else? Um, I mean, I, I'm gonna answer it as a consumer. There's too much crap out there, and it's hard to find anything. I mean, it, it's even hard for me to find anything when I just go on like, like the Amazon bookstore or, or Kindle or whatever, you know? So um, it's really hard to get attention. It's really hard to sustain attention. And I think one of the challenges um, for a lot of us who maybe came up before the web was kind of the rage and social was the rage and, and Facebook and all that stuff was that um, the way that we think about what our great stories aren't necessarily are what are playing very well in terms of, of going viral. And so then you have the case of where you do a story that's 10,000 words that you spent five months reporting on, and then a web editor spends you know a half hour retooling the headline so that he thinks it'll work well on Facebook, and it's a kind of a weird disconnect. And I think the other real frustration I've had is that you have the, you know, you have these great stories that you put so much time into that really are kind of what the brand does most. Um, but people are so used to everything sucking online. So the headline that the person wrote to do well on Facebook, it just seems like every other headline out there. And so no one actually expects this wonderful 8,000 word detailed reported story because on the internet, everything is kind of equal, at least on the surface. And so it's hard to actually figure out what has value. Um, and everything becomes very devalued, and I think that is one of the challenges of getting people to subscribe to DECA or getting them to, you know, I mean, one of my main challenges is we have, you know, 700, you know, thousand people who actually pay for Esquire, right, in print. How do I get them to pay for the same content online? Well, they're used to paying for nothing because they're used to it all being horrible online. Mm -hmm. So it's really, you know, how do we show people that there's something has value online? How do we show them? Not even, getting, not even getting it to them, but actually showing them, you know, this is worth your time or your money. He's speaking as a consumer. I'll speak as the journalist. Uh, for pre-web, I worked for a long time, for years, on a story in a very, very small country in Guyana in South America. And the challenge that I had was to come back from that place to this and three or four other cities and convince a very small number of people, which today, 15 years later is even smaller, of the relevance of this, and that was very difficult. If the modern challenge is that I have to explain the relevance of this to the public using modern tools that allow me to connect to the public, I'll take that bet. I'll probably fail equivalently, but I'll take that bet. Uh, as it happens, you can succeed at both. So, you know, I, I think I agree with everything he said uh, from a consumer standpoint. I, I use aggregation to try to you know, separate wheat from chaff or what feels like wheat, for, wheat and chaff for me, which may not feel the same for him or for you. But again, it's a public good. If I'm going to go out there and try to report the stories I want to report, which don't have a really clear, I can't make a clear argument for some of the things that are going to interest me to Tyler. I know that. And that's no judgment on Esquire, and it's no judgment on him. I just know that that doesn't work in that space. OK, the spaces that it might have worked at 15 years ago, a lot of them don't exist, and they're not paying anymore. So where's that space if I continue to have this sort of foolish notion that I should continue with this story? We're trying to create that space. Maybe it's a fool's errand, but again, I, I don't mind trying to convince you that you should read about Guyana. I think I can convince you. We should, this was to be a yeah. party. Right. So, um, <laughs> so we should probably take one or two more questions and then, but n then not everybody leave and, yeah. and drink the wine over there and all that kind of stuff. You so start drinking the wine now. Yeah, but, but yeah. yeah. Why don't we just start drinking the wine? Yeah. Anyone? Anyone? All right then. 
Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>